So today I want to talk about a stolen Confederate monument. Now this is a story that I originally was not going to cover, but as I started thinking more and more about the details, I began to realize that a number of the underlying issues within this story were worth talking about, even if the story itself may seem somewhat trivial. So essentially what's going on is that a Confederate monument, which is estimated at a value of $500,000, was stolen from a cemetery in Alabama last month. The group that stole the statue was demanding that the United Daughters of the Confederacy hang a large banner outside its headquarters for the statue to be returned. Now this uh, statue is known as the Jefferson Davis Memorial Chair, and it is located originally in Selma Cemetery. The organization that's being uh, held responsible is called White Lies Matter, and they wanted the banner from the United Daughters of the Confederacy hung by the anniversary of the Confederacy surrender in the Civil War, or they would not return the chair. Now, the banner, which the group has already delivered to the United Daughters of the Confederacy, reportedly features a quote from Asada Shakur, a Black Liberation Army activist wanted by the FBI for the 1973 murder of a New Jersey state trooper. The rulers of this country have always considered their property more important than our lives, the banner reads. Now, the failure to hang the banner, according to this organization, would result in the monument, which is an, inno uh, an, an ornate stone chair, immediately being turned into a toilet. And while that sounds hilarious, there's a lot more to this story besides the toilet humor. So since the time of that particular article being written, two white local business people were arrested and claimed their innocence in the case. When the monument was discovered to be 300 miles away and was returned to the Daughters of the Confederacy, it's somewhere being stored in some sort of storage and will be placed back in the cemetery in due time. Now again, this story seems a little bit silly. There are just people who stole a monument and wanted to threaten to use it as a toilet. And uh, basically, it's going to be returned, and that seems to be the end of it. But what I thought was very interesting in all of this is the question of all of the details of this story. Namely, the value of the monument, the usage of Asada Shakur, and her story when compared to that of Jefferson Davis and the quote itself from Asada Shakur. So first, I want to go over a discussion of value. Why is this statue valued at approximately $500,000? On what estimate is it worth that much? The prosecuting attorneys seem to have made the claim, but on what ground have they done this? Why is it that this statue would even be worth anything, let alone $500,000? And I ask this, because I cannot imagine the value of this statue being $500,000 on some sort of market value system determined by economic principles. A statue like this that sat in a cemetery since 1893 is worth that much? I have been able to find no proof and no evidence to show that anybody has determined this value based on market principles. So we have to ask the question, where does this value actually come from? Now, it doesn't come from usefulness, as the chair has a hole in it and potential damage to it, and is used as ornamentation. So perhaps more important is, who is this statue even valuable to? Now, the statue, to me, would only have value to someone who already values the historical importance and wants to commemorate the actions of someone like Jefferson Davis. And even then, this is not even something Davis used. It was a gift presented to him by the ladies of Selma in honor of him um, and his life in 1893, four years after his passing. So what does it say that the prosecuting attorney in this case, and that the state itself being represented by this prosecuting attorney, have so highly valued a chair that was created in celebration of a Confederate president years after he died? It tells us, in my opinion, that there is still some sympathy to the cause. And given that, the bulk of the case and the cause are centered around racism and the continued practice of slavery, we must ask what value that represents towards black people who live in the area. 
and why it exists in that area in the first place. Which brings us actually back to the issue between the stories of Asada Shakur and Jefferson Davis, and how we remember them both in terms of society as a whole. Now, the story of Asada Shakur is far more complex than I can cover in this particular video, but my goal here is not to fully address anybody's story, but rather to show the juxtaposition between Shakur and Jefferson Davis, and more so to try to represent the differences rather than talk about a specific narrative here. So Asada Shakur, in her history, was a member of, a, of the Black Panther Party, as well as the Black Liberation Army. During her time as the leader of the Harlem chapter of the Black Panther Party, she coordinated free breakfast programs for children. She organized free clinics and community outreach organizations. And by the time she became a member of the Black Liberation Army, she was using guerrilla tactics on state targets in the name of Black Liberation until she was arrested and prosecuted for the death of a New Jersey state trooper in 1973. She was sentenced to life imprisonment on murder charges until she escaped from prison in 1979. She then made herself scarce and turned up five years later in 1984 in Cuba, where she had been granted political asylum and presumably lives there to this day. The U.S. government has her name to this day on the FBI Most Wanted Terrorist list, and her arrest is valued at $2 million. In the meantime, when we look at the historical narrative of Jefferson Davis, we learn that Davis was a U.S. congressperson and a secretary of state during his political career before the Civil War. During this time, he was against secession, but felt it was still a state's rights to do so and often voted in ways during his time in the Senate that supported Southern positions such as tariffs and pro-slavery actions. He raised a volunteer group during his time uh, to fight Mexico during the Mexican-American War, and by 1860, he is said to have owned 113 slaves. When his home state of Mississippi seceded, he was made a major general of the Army of Mississippi, and the Constitutional Convention of the Southern States made him the Confederate president in the election they had, and he was described as, quote, the champion of a slave society and embodied the values of a planter class. At the conclusion of the war, he was imprisoned for treason in 1865. However, no treason trials were actually implemented due to a lack of faith in their success and because it would prevent reconciliation according to the North. Davis was released two years later at $100,000 bail, posted by private citizens who supported his cause. Davis then spent years traveling between Quebec and Cuba and Europe in search of work. He started a foundry business and toured the southern states until President Johnson pardoned him in 1868. He continued with numerous other business ventures and silently disagreed with the federal occupation of the South and never gave up his belief that blacks were inferior and that there was a desire to return to the southern social order. People even tried to ask him to become a senator again, even though the 14th Amendment explicitly made that impossible. When he died in 1889, there were parades held in his honor. Cities and states came out and celebrated not his death, but his life. He had monuments and buildings, including a hospital and a highway, named in his honor, and in 1978, he was given full citizenship back by President Jimmy Carter. Now, all of this begs the important question. Why is Jefferson Davis forgiven? when Asada Shakur continues to be viewed as a criminal? Why do we value the life of one police officer that Asada Shakur is responsible for killing rather than the hundreds of lives of slaves that Jefferson Davis owned on a plantation and the countless more that he sought to keep in bondage with his presidency during his treason? Why is Davis retroactively granted citizenship while Shakur remains an exile in Cuba wanted for over $2 million? Again, what does this say about the lives of Black Americans? Which brings us full circle, back to Asada Shakur's quote, 
and why it is being represented in this particular case, and why this organization of White Lives Matter wants the Daughters of the Confederacy to post it. The rulers of this country have always considered their property more important than our lives, said Asada Shakur. The value of this chair is represented by the commemoration of a man who held people's lives captive as property. Meanwhile, he got pardoned from the state, continued to thrive in business ventures. He was celebrated after his death by entire cities and states. However, the position of black liberation is one that is unforgivable, and the capture of a person who fought for this is priced in the millions. While this is a seemingly small story about a Confederate monument and a joke and prank in which it was stolen and tried to use, be used as toilet humor, its roots run deep in the history of white supremacy in the United States and the way that the state prioritizes white stories and histories and values those higher than the stories of people of color. So with that said, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button and bell for notifications. You can follow me on Twitter and check out my Discord in the description down below. My name is Anarchist Tara, and I hope you enjoyed watching.